a great doxology where he is able to keep us and to present us. The one who saved us is the one who's going to bring us all the way home, you guys. Amen. 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 And we're thankful for that. So let's turn to the book of Jude. And we're going to dive right into it. So again, it's the 65th book in your Bible, right before the book of Revelation. It starts out like this in verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. As is typical with many of the New Testament letters, the author identifies himself right out of the gates and then identifies the recipients of the letter and then some sort of greeting. So Jude is the author of the letter. In the New Testament, there are six different individuals that are named Jude, but their name actually in English isn't translated as Jude. It's the same Greek word, but it's translated every other time except this time as Judas. Judas is also related the word to uh, the word Judah, which was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of the sons of Jacob. It was the kingly tribe. It was the tribe that David came from. It was the tribe then that Jesus, according to his humanity, came from. Judas was a very popular name in the first century because of a hero in their past named Judas Maccabeus. He was the one in the second century BC that cleansed the temple after Antiochus IV Epiphanes had desecrated it with the abomination of desolation. And so it's celebrated to this day, the Feast of Hanukkah, because of what Judas Maccabeus did. And so it was a very popular name and a very well-loved name until you get to Judas Iscariot. And then it's interesting that the English translations, even though this particular Greek name is translated every time as either Judas for the five other people that are in the New Testament or Judah, if it's referring back to the tribe here in this particular book, it's translated Jude. That's what the English translators chose to do, maybe because of the stigma of Judas Iscariot. You know what's interesting when you go through the Bible and look at Judas's name, Judas Iscariot's name every time. Every time he's tagged with that act, the one who betrayed Jesus. He's either tagged with that or he's in the process of betraying Jesus. That's what he's known for. And I think that's what influenced the English translators of our Bible. And so which Jude is this? Well, it's not Judas Iscariot. I'll tell you that right now. Okay. <laughs> This Jude, I'll just cut right to it. It's believed by most commentators that this is the half-brother of Jesus. Jesus was virgin born, but Joseph and Mary had other children. And we read in Matthew chapter 13 that uh, there, were, there were four other brothers and there were uh, an unnamed number of sisters. So he came from a, a, a decent sized family, I would think. One of those brothers was named James, and this would be the brother of Jesus, but more accurately, the half-brother of Jesus, because they shared the same mother, but not the same father. Jesus' father is God, and their father was Joseph. And so James and Jude were half-brothers of Jesus. James was not the brother of John, sons of Zebedee, but rather he was the half-brother of Jesus, and he became the leader in the church in Jerusalem, and the book that's in the Bible called James is largely believed to be written by him. And here, Jude is the author of this one, also believed to be, uh, strongly believed to be the half-brother of Jesus. Now, having said that, it's really interesting how he identifies himself, isn't it? He doesn't identify himself as Jude. Jesus is my big brother, so I'm special, and you need to listen to what I have to say. But you notice how he started that. Jude a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Now, that becomes all the more interesting when you look into the Gospels and you find out that his brothers didn't believe in him. Now, it's interesting, in the, the Gospels we have, in Matthew and Luke, we have the account of the birth of Jesus. And then, of course, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have the life and ministry of Jesus from when he was 30 years old to 33 and a half. But there's only one small part 
and that's in the Gospel of Luke, where it tells about Jesus when he was 12 years old. But other than that, we have zero information as to what it was like in Jesus' household when he was growing up. And we can, only, we can only wonder what it was like to be the younger brother of Jesus, you know, growing up in the household. You know, you would have the ultimate big brother, put it that way, I guess. But um, Jesus here had these half-brothers, and they were, uh, they were people who ended up believing in him. In John chapter 7, we find out that his brothers didn't believe him in him. In Acts chapter 1, we find out that his brothers are in the upper room with the disciples awaiting the power from on high, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So what changed from John chapter 7 to Acts chapter 1? I think the answer is, is they saw their big brother risen from the dead, conquering death. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us specifically that Jesus appeared to James, one of his half-brothers. And it also says that he appeared to over 500 at one time, and we can just speculate and guess that maybe Jude was one of those as well. But he's a believer, he's a, a, a strong leader here in the first century, and he's written this letter. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, now the recipients to those who are called, sanctified, some translations have beloved, by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to ask you, are you reading your own mail here? Would you say that you are the called, that you are beloved of the Father, that you are set apart for his glory, that you are preserved in Jesus Christ? If you are, if you're a believer in Jesus, then this is going to apply to you today as well. Now, admittedly, it was written to first century Christians, but there's general Christian truth in this that's going to be applicable to all of us and for all of us this morning. I actually love the last phrase of verse one, preserved in Jesus Christ. And that's kind of what we've been singing this morning. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us fault, faultless before him. The one who's begun that good work in us. And that's what we've got to remember. He's the one that's going to complete it. Yeah, He's the one that's going to be able to cause us to make it through all the way till the end. I mean, so many times we think we're, we're, you know, I wonder if I'm really going to make it. Am I going to make it all the way to the end? Am I going to get to the pearly gates and am I going to be turned away or are they going to let me in? He's the one who saved you by his grace and he's the one who's going to bring you into the kingdom by his grace as well. It's all about what he has done. He wishes them a blessing here. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. That's precious. Mercy, the compassion of God. Peace, the peace that passes all understanding and also the love of God be not just yours, but be multiplied to you. And then he starts, verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It seems like his initial desire was to write concerning their common salvation, not common like cheap, but common like it's the salvation we share. His initial desire, it seems, was to write concerning the truth of our salvation. Do you realize that new covenant truth that we get is really derived from the writers of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul and the general uh, epistles that we have here? In the Gospels, we get the life and ministry of Jesus. And of course, in the book of Acts, we get the sermons that were coming forth by the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. But it's here in the letters that we get the doctrine. It's the doctrine that we're saved by grace through faith. We find that in the book of Ephesians. And so Jude is saying, my desire, it seems like he's saying, is I wanted to write to you concerning our common salvation, but he found it necessary, rather, to exhort them to contend earnestly for the faith. The word contend, it means to, um, it implies a strenuous effort. It is used of participants in athletic contests. So as an athlete, you're trying your hardest. And he's here saying, I'm exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. And he's going to give us the reason why. It's because there's been people that have crept in, that have crept in and are bringing heresy. And so you need to be able to stand up for the truth, exhorted to stand up for the truth. When Paul was writing to Timothy, he said that the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of the truth. 
you're the ones who are standing for the truth and you are the ones who are upholding the truth to the rest of the world. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter wrote, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready to give a defense. It's a reasoned argument as to why you believe what you believe. The word defense in 1 Peter 3.15, the Greek word apologia, that's where we get the word apologetics from. And apologetics is the study of defending why you believe what you believe. And guys, remember, I want to remind you that there's a mountain of evidence that this book we're going through right here rests upon, okay? There is a mountain of evidence that we can believe that this book is the word of God and we can trust that it came from God to us to tell us about him and to tell us about what he wants for our lives. There's a lot of faith-based systems out there, isn't there? You know, I didn't grow up in the church, but as soon as I started getting a little bit interested in Christianity, I realized that you've got all of these different places. And a lot of people who, don't, who aren't familiar with uh, religions kind of lump them all in one boat. You know, there's all kinds of different ones, but don't they all really basically believe the same thing? Or, or maybe you have the take that, well, everybody is meeting in their own place and everybody thinks they're the right ones. You know what I'm saying? We're the only, I haven't met anybody who goes to a church and say, you know what, we're not really the ones with the truth. It's the, it's the church down the street. <laughs> everybody thinks they're in the right place. And it's a good question to answer. Why are there so many different religions? Why are there so many different Christian denominations? And are there any differences between them? Are there differences between the Mormons and the Baptists? Are there differences between the Buddhists and the Catholics? That's a good question. It's a question that we need to answer, and it's a question that we can answer because we go to the foundation of what those faiths are based upon. And Christianity is based upon this book that's in front of us. And like I said, there is a mountain of evidence that this book rests upon. If you want to know what the mountain of evidence is, you can go, and this is the great thing, you can find it on the internet, you can go to our website under teachings, under topical, and under apologetics, or the authenticity of the Bible. And it's a question that we need to be able to answer. Because again, how do you know which place is the right way to go? Well, there's a lot of different faith-based systems. Christianity stands head and shoulders above the rest, again, because of what it's founded upon. There's a lot of different denominations. Why are there different denominations? I want, I want to tell you this. You could go to the Baptist church, and you're going to get the same truth that you're getting here. Those at the Baptist church are our brothers and sisters in Christ. When you think about it, suppose we lived in a big city, and you've got all of these Christians. You can't all fit in one room anyway, right? So you've got to meet in separate places. That's what they did in the first century. They had, they had house churches where they met. And so we would meet in different places. So let's say you lived in Orange County, okay? You lived in Orange County, and you want to go to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Do you realize that there are dozens and dozens of Bible teaching and Bible believing church you could choose from in Orange County. Which one are you going to go to? Well, <laughs> it might be, I'll go to the one that's closest to my house. Or it might be, I'll go to the one where, personal preference, I like the music there. Or it might be, I go to one, personal preference, where the pastor, he's about my age. And he has young kids. I have young kids. He's going through similar things that I, I can relate to what he's saying is his application points more. You see, we, we kind of pick places to go. It doesn't mean we believe different things. It just means that we have different personal preferences and we're, we're in other areas and meeting in other places because we can't all fit in the same room. So there are denominations where we believe the same and then there are faith-based systems where we don't believe the same. And there are cults where we don't believe the same. So we need to answer the question for ourselves individually, what are the differences? So that we know what we believe, so that we can, like Jude is saying, earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And that's going to be a driving theme as we go throughout this book. So he gives us the reason why, that they need to earnestly contend for the faith. He says in verse 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, 
who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are certain men who have crept in unnoticed. Do you realize that most false teachers don't have a neon t-shirt on saying, I'm a false teacher, come and listen to me? Do you realize that most of the cults, the majority of what they're teaching is true? It's the little bit of poison that ruins the whole thing. And so he's saying there are those that would creep in unnoticed, that would taint the body, that would contaminate. And these are those that are marked out for this condemnation. But one of the things that he points out here is that they turn, middle of verse 4, the grace of our God into lewdness. The word lewdness means extreme immorality. In the NIV, it's translated license for immorality. They turn the grace of our God into a license to be immoral. The Bible tells us that we're saved by grace. You know, we typically think growing up, if you didn't grow up in a Christian home, you typically think that all of the good people go to heaven and all of the bad people go to hell. It's kind of a, a system of works that are, are really our society is built upon, you know, whether it's at home or whether it's at school or whether it's in a job. If you do good, you get rewarded. If you do bad, you suffer the consequences for it. So we think in life, if I do good, I get to go to heaven. If I do bad, I end up going to hell. Do you realize that there are going to be murderers in heaven? Do you realize that a murderer can go to heaven? Well, that's not a person that's done good, is it? It's a person who's done really bad. Do you realize, though, that that murderer who's sentenced, let's say, to life in prison can hear about Jesus Christ and can surrender his life to the Lord and trust in Jesus Christ and receive the grace that God offers? God's favor is what his grace is, his forgiveness, and that person can be completely forgiven by God of the murder that he committed. He's still going to spend his life in jail, though, because there's consequences to suffer. But God has forgiven him, and now he's able to go to heaven. You see, our salvation is not based upon how good we've been in this life. It's based upon what God has done for us. It's the forgiveness that he offers us. And we have the choice to receive it or to reject it. You know, you would think, well, anybody would receive that, right? It's not true. And, and the reason why people don't is because they want to be the captain of their own ship. You know, you know deep inside, if I become a Christian, I can't live my life the way I wanted to live it. Because I know, I knew that. I'm, I'm speaking from experience. I knew if I became a Christian, I couldn't follow my dream. And I didn't want to give up my dream. And so I didn't become a Christian. And so people want to see their plan fulfilled in their life and not surrender their life to the Lord. I want to tell you something. God's plan is so much better than your plan for your life. We're really deceived. You know, we're really deceived by the enemy in thinking that we become a Christian and life is miserable after that. My life is, I mean, I've gone through hard times as a Christian, but I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Don't know if I've met anybody personally that would say, man, I wish I never became a Christian. I wasted so many years of my life. You know, it's not just getting to go to heaven. It's the relationship with Jesus and his people right now here on earth. It's truly life, life abundantly, as Jesus said. And so the grace of God is what our salvation is based upon. If, again, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So our salvation is based upon grace. You know, some people think if you preach the grace of God that it's not about how good you are, that people will just run out and sin if you preach the grace of God. Do you realize that that's what was happening right here? That the people were turning the grace of God into a license for immorality. Let me say, we're saved by his grace. Let me tell you that there's liberty in Jesus, but it is not an excuse for any of us as Christians to live in sin. God has saved us, and he's shown us how he wants us to live. Be holy, for I am holy. That's Old Testament. You know what? It's New Testament, too. It's quoted in the New Testament. Be holy. Be separated for God's exclusive use because he is holy. 
So God doesn't want us to be drunks. He doesn't want us to be drug users. He doesn't want us to be immoral and sleep around. He wants us to be set apart for his glory. And so what these guys were doing was turning the grace of God into lewdness. It says in Galatians 5.13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And in 1 Peter 2.16, you're free, yes, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. And do I have freedom in Christ? Absolutely. Can I make decisions as to, as to how I exercise that freedom in Christ? Absolutely. But it can't be my indulgence to go sin and God's going to forgive me. It doesn't work that way. If somebody has the attitude of, you know what, I'll just go sin and then I'll ask God to forgive me because it's about his grace, then I would really question that person's relationship with the Lord. You know, he died for us. Guys, we're no longer our own. That's the idea of Christianity. He bought us. And that's why I didn't become a Christian for so many years. Because I knew that if I became a Christian, I was his. And I was deceived by the devil. And I wanted to follow after my dream. And I thank God for his patience. And I thank God for his long suffering in my life. You do too. I can see it. <laughs> Amen. So this is the thing. Now, I'm going to have to pick up the pace here just a little bit. In the bulk of the book, he's simply going to point out this is what these guys who've crept in unnoticed are doing. And he's not going to say, this is how you can know who they are so you can go and get them and you can lock them up or you can tar and feather them or you can do whatever. That's not the job of the church. The job of the church is to recognize the false teacher and to steer clear from it and to not let it influence their own lives. That's where he's going to go with this. So the bulk of this is simply going to point out who they are by what they're doing. So verse 5, he says, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now, as you go through the book of Jude, there's a number of Old Testament examples that we find, and you literally could, I mean, seriously, spend months in the book of Jude. And in a very good way, you could go back and look at the Old Testament stories, and there's great examples in those historical truths. But we're just going to be looking at the book and taking the truth that he's pulling out of this. Yes, those Jews that came out of Egypt, many of them didn't believe and they died in the wilderness. They, they suffered judgment because of their unbelief. The point I believe he's making is these false teachers that have crept in, their dues coming. They're marked out. God's going to take care of them in the end. In verse 6, and the angels, another Old Testament example, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. You see the same idea? You've got angels now who have sinned. Judgment is coming when that day hits. Now, there's dispute over as to what verse 6 is referring to. Angels who did not keep their proper domain, but rather left their own abode. Some think it's simply referring to those angels who sided with Satan when he rebelled against God. Others will tie it back to Genesis chapter 6, the passage where the sons of God saw the daughters of men and, and took them as wives, basically interpreting the sons of God as fallen angels, demons cohabiting with women and having an ungodly offspring. Do you realize there are a lot of people that believe that? It sounds sci-fi, I know, but there's a lot of people who believe that, and there's, there's a lot of good reason to look at that. You might say, well, angels, angels don't marry. Well, it says in the Gospels that we're going to be like the angels, neither marrying nor giving in marriage, but it doesn't say anything about whether they could have physical relations. We just assume that from that. So there are some, and a lot of good commentators that think that maybe that's what it's referring to. It's interesting to see how verse 6 ties into verse 7. It says in verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, 
are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, he gives another Old Testament example of Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction, the fire and brimstone that was rained down upon them. But isn't it interesting how it's tied together with verse 6, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, to who? To the angels of verse 6, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Now, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, what was their sin? What jumps into your mind? What was their sin why God destroyed them? What jumps into your mind? What, what seems to jump out is the immorality, the sexual immorality that was there. When the two angels went into Sodom to bring Lot and his family out, Lot brought them into her home, and the men of the city surrounded Lot's house, beat on the door, and said, let the men out. So the angels looked to them like men. Let the men out that we may know them carnally, that we might have sexual relations with them, homosexuality. It's interesting, though, that it is angels and human beings that are connected with that as well. Point being, I'm getting off in sci-fi rabbit trail mode here. Point being, judgment on those who came out of Egypt for not believing. Point being, judgment on the angels who left their proper, proper, <laughs> proper domain and the judgment that would fall on the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Likewise, verse 8, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. These dreamers were simply talking about the certain men who have crept in unnoticed of verse 4. They're dreamers, they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they speak evil of dignitaries. There's not a submission to the authority that is set above them. You know, in the scriptures, we find that for the Christian, there is to be a mutual submission that all of us are to have. We're, we're dual citizens. We're citizens of heaven, praise God, and we're citizens of this great country. Thank you, Lord. And as citizens, we need to be submitted to our government. Now, there's many of us who don't like what our government is doing. A lot of the laws that have been passed, we don't like it. We don't like that our tax dollars are going to, to these things. I'm going to tell you something. We have been blessed to have the privilege to vote. I hope everybody in this room that's old enough is voting because I understand there's not a whole lot to choose from out there, but we need to exercise that God-given right to get out and vote and to continue to pray for this country that God's mercy would fall upon it, that we truly would be one nation under God. Amen. Amen. So there's to be, there is to be a mutual submission. There's to be a submission within the body of Christ as well. You know, there's to be a mutual submission one to another, but also God has, God has set it in a hierarchy to raise up leadership within the churches. And I think that's the main point that he's focusing on right here. These guys are coming in as lone rangers. You know, they're going to do what they want to do. They're not going to submit to any kind of authority. Like John said last week in 3 John, how he was rejected by, by diatrophies. Within the family, there's to be a mutual submission. Husbands to wives, wives to husbands, kids to parents, you know. I realize as children, your parents are doing the best they can. And as children, realize that your parents are going to stand before God one day. And they're going to give an account for how they raised you and how they molded you. And the best thing that you can do as children is you can pray for your parents and you can submit to them as they're seeking to lead you according to the truths of God's word. We need that mutual submission, but here these guys are rejecting authority, and they're speaking evil of dignitaries. Now, the Greek word for dignitaries is doxa. We get our word glory from that. The NIV translates that celestial beings. The NAS trans translates that angelic majesties. So the evil speaking could be, yes, just to human authority, but maybe it's to the angelic realm. Speaking, of, do you realize that the angels are greater in power and might than humans? I mean, these guys are amazing. And these guys are so arrogant and cocky that they're speaking against the angelic majesties. It segues that into verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Here you have Michael, who won't even bring an, a reviling accusation. 
won't trash talk the devil. And this is Michael. Michael is the only one who's mentioned as an archangel, the chief angel. He's actually, he's in Daniel, Daniel 11, Daniel 12, Daniel 10, and Daniel 12, Revelation 12, here in Jude, verse 9. He is the guardian angel of Israel. He's always fighting. He is the one that's the protector of the nation of Israel. And yet he, Michael, the archangel, won't even throw a reviling accusation against the devil. And yet these guys who have crept in unawares, these guys despise and speak evil of the dignitaries. Now, I find it interesting, intriguing in verse 9, what Michael and the devil were disputing about with Moses' body. Moses died, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34. He died, and it says that nobody knows where his grave is. And it also says that God is the one that buried him. (laughs) I wonder if there was a plan for Moses' body. Realize that Moses appeared again on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah when Jesus was uh, heading for the cross, ultimately. I believe personally that Moses is one of the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. And it's because of the miracles that they're doing. And and also it's because of what they represented. The law and the prophets. Moses, the author of the law, the one who received the law from God. Elijah, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Old Testament prophet. I mean, he's the one who got to go in a chariot of fire with horses of fire straight up into heaven. Anyway. You can see where you can spend months in this book, can't you? Because there's a lot of areas you could go. Verse 10, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast in these things, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, verse 11, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Cain, Balaam, Korah. Guys, there's a three-point sermon right there, all right? (laughs) Now, no hands raised. This is like a a test my Bible knowledge moment, okay, for individuals. No hands raised. How many of you recognize Cain, Balaam, and Korah? How many of you can recount in your mind this is the background story about Cain, Balaam, and Korah? You know why I say that? because we should know the background story so that we can understand the point Jude's trying to make because he's grabbing them as an illustration. This is why we put such an emphasis on reading the Bible and why we encourage others to read through the Bible, to make it part of your daily devotional life so that you're never that far away from these stories that serve to be great examples. Many of them of what to do, but many of them of what not to do with their lives. So briefly, these guys have gone in the way of Cain. Cain murdered his brother Abel. Cain was of that wicked one. Cain's heart was not right before God. Balaam was greedy for money. He was hired by Balak, the king of Moab, to come and curse the people of God. And so Balaam went before God and said, God, should I go? And God said, no, don't go. But he kept asking. How many have ever done that? God, can I have this? Can I do that? No. But we keep asking, and Balaam ended up getting God's permissive will. God permitted it to happen, but Balaam ended up dying because of that in the land of Moab. So he was greedy for the money that the king of Moab was offering him. And the rebellion of Korah, Korah was of the tribe of Levi. This took place in the wilderness wandering. Korah was, he and his family were responsible for the sacred articles within the tabernacle. The Levites divvied up the stuff, and they would carry it throughout the wilderness. Well, Korah, he was of the family that got to be able to carry, like the Ark of the, not the Ark of the Covenant, that was the priest, but got to be able to carry, like, the candelabra and the the table of showbread. So it was a really important position, but he wasn't happy with that. He's like, Moses, you know, we're people too. I mean, we can be leaders as well. And so they were jealous, I think, of Moses and Aaron and their position. And so there was a test that went forth as to who was God's man, and it didn't go good for Korah. Korah, Dathan, Abiram, it says that the ground opened up and swallowed them and their tents and their families into it. That's the ultimate earthquake. It was the judgment of God because of their rebellion. And one thing that I 
I notice is that their rebellion affected their families too. Husbands, dads, our sin affects the rest of our family. We've got to recognize that. God's allowed us to be the spiritual leaders in the home. It's a high responsibility that we need to take. What's interesting to see, even though they lost their families, we read way down through the Bible that the sons of Korah did not perish because they're in the psalmists in the days of David. And they're the ones who said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Dad, I think you're out of your mind. We're getting away from you. And the ground opens up and swallows Korah and company down into it. And it's the rebellion that's being spoken of here. Verse 12, these are spots in your love feasts. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I, I love the illustrations that Jude uses in painting this out. But simply put, they're... they're a lot of show and not a lot of substance. Clouds that don't throw any water down, trees that don't have any fruit on them, and stars that have left their natural course. They've left the natural way and are going astray and leading others astray as well. Verse 14, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch, again, we're back in the Old Testament. Enoch prophesied that this would take place. Again, what would take place? It's the judgment of God that would fall. That, that the bulk of this book is reflecting back on those men who have crept in unaware. And Jude is saying, you need to contend for the faith. We make no mistake about it. God's judgment is going to fall on them, just like his judgment fell time and time again, and as is prophesied here by Enoch. Enoch was the seventh from Adam. You know, in the Old Testament, you read through it, and there's some genealogies that, let's be honest, most of us scan through those real quickly, you know, and Genesis 5 is, well, it is kind of an exception, because in Genesis 5, we read about the descendants beginning from Adam and Seth, and, you know, Seth lived so many years and had a son, and then he lived so many years, and he was this old, and he died. And then his son lived so many years and had a son, and he lived another so many years, and then he died. What's interesting is you, you add up all these, or just look at how old they lived. I mean, they were 800. They were 900 years old. This was all during the time of the flood. But Enoch, even though everybody around him in that generation or generations are living to be 900 plus years old, he only lived to be 365. But yet you realize he only lived that long because God loved him so much. It's like God took him off of this world that was cursed by sin. It says in Genesis 5.24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. You say, oh, oh you mean he died? God took him home? No. No, he didn't die. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Isn't that precious? Here's a guy who's walking with God. In other words, he's living his life uprightly before the Lord, and it pleased God so much, he's like, I'm bringing you home. You know? and that, he's one of two people in the Bible who never died. Who's the other one? Elijah, right? He was taken up in the chariots of fire, horses of fire into heaven. That's why some people think, the two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah. Because some will say, well, it says in Hebrews 9, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And so these are the only two men that have never died, and everybody has to die once. No, wait a minute. There's going to be a whole generation of people, amen, that are not going to see death because the Lord's going to come and remove them off the earth. Isn't that interesting? Isn't Enoch kind of a, a neat little picture of what the rapture of the church is going to be? reaching down because they please me and bringing them home. You know, the next verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
It shows us that our faith is pleasing to him. And I've said this before, but I, I believe real faith is trusting in God even when you don't understand. When you don't understand why, I don't understand why this is going on, but God, I, I trust you through this. I trust you anyway. And so the judgment that would come. Verse 16, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. The apostles warned. I don't know if you recognize it, but as we've been going through the books, 2 Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, now we've come into Jude, they all at one point are warning about the false teachers who are going to come in and to be prepared to stand against them. These are sensual persons, verse 19. The idea is they are worldly-minded people who are devoid of the spirit, and they cause divisions among you. So I, I believe from verse 4 to 19, he's dedicated that to saying, this is who the people are. This is how you'll recognize them. Make sure that they don't come in and influence you and make double sure that you don't become like them because their judgment is certain. Now he gets in verse 20. But you, beloved, this is what you're to do. And notice it's not go out and tar and feather these guys. Our job as Christians is to recognize the false teachers, to recognize the heresy, yes, to expose it. But our job is to proclaim the truth. We're the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We're not to fight against the heresy. We're to lift up the truth, contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So you, beloved, verse 20, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So verses 20 and 21, this is what you're to do, beloved. You're to build yourself up. Kind of sounds like an individual responsibility, doesn't it? Like, we have a responsibility to build ourselves up. I'll take my kids to church so the Sunday school teacher can teach them about God. I'll take my kids to youth group so the youth pastor, I'll just go to church so that, no, we have an individual responsibility to build ourselves up in the faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's a responsibility that's given to us as Christians, as the ones who are going to hold forth the truth to know the truth to be able to defend the faith and earnestly contend for it. So you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, notice, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit, a couple of different ideas with that. Praying in the will of the Holy Spirit, within the will of God. Not my will, but your will be done. Praying assisted by the Holy Spirit. You ever get so distraught over something words just fail. Yeah, personally, I believe that's what's Ro what Romans 8, 26 is talking about, where it says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, being overwhelmed by a situation where it's not our Father in heaven, it's just like, oh, God, oh, you know what I'm saying? And I believe that those cries as we're crying out from our hearts before the Lord, that God understands. He can understand and he can interpret what's going on in our life as we cry out to him. He's our only help. How can we truly be built up? It's not just a head knowledge coming from the word. It's a relationship where we're crying out to God. We're at the feet of Jesus to receive from him, to be built up, and then to be able to operate out of the overflow coming forth from our life. Another truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the gift of speaking in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4, it says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Notice that. That gift is designed to build up the individual. And then later on in verse 15, he says, I will pray with the Spirit, okay, enabled by the Holy Spirit. And so 
praying in the Holy Spirit, a couple of different ideas there. One of the main things I see in these two verses is in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. How do you do that? How do you keep yourself in the love of God? Is it, is it oh, I don't want God to hate me, so I want to do good things so that he's going to love me? I don't think that's it. I think it's keeping yourself available to be under the fount where his blessings pour out. Great story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, when he's wallowing in the mire, does the father still love him? Absolutely. Is he benefiting from that love when he's wallowing in the mire? He's not. He's gotten himself outside of the father's love. And I think that's the idea. Keep yourself in the love of God. Stay in the center of God's will. Stay in fellowship and communion with him. Jesus said in John 15, 9, abide in my love. In the end of verse 21, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's no better day. There's no better day than his return. You know what? I mean, this world has a lot of good to offer, but there's nothing better than to ultimately be able to leave this place and go home and be with him. You know, I, I don't think I felt that as strongly as I have this past week. We went up to uh, Julian and saw Pastor Mike and, uh, and his wife, Jackie, and, and he's dying of cancer. They give him two years to live, and that's without any treatment. They give him 10 years with treatment, so he could be a white, uh, around for quite some time. But, but this is a guy, and it's not like we spend a lot of time together. You know, I could go, I could go a year or two without seeing him, but there's a relationship there. He's the one who married Marion and I, and there's just a, a close relationship there. And as I'm sitting there and we're praying for him when, it's, when we're going to leave, I just think, God, you know, he's got, I know he's going to be going pretty, and I know we're all going to be going, but with him, he's kind of got the, the calendar open, you know. He's going to be going pretty soon. And what went through my mind was, was for the first time, almost kind of an envy, you know. I thought my friend is going. I want to go too. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. I've never felt that way before, like that, when you're looking at death. But I, I guess because it's who it is, you know, because of, of my friend who's preached the gospel and who married my wife and I, and now he's going to go and he's going to be gone, you know, and I'm going to miss him. And it's like, wouldn't it be great if we could all just go together, you know? <laughs> Let's just keep praying to that end. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. It would be so much easier to not have to face this that we all have to face alone. It's like the batter going up to the plate. The rest of the team's in the dugout. You're going that road alone, you know. But our eyes are on him because he is the one who is able to keep us. We're getting there. We're getting there. It says in verse 22, and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. As the church of God, you're to keep yourself in the love of God. You're to build yourself up, but you're also to be able to reach out and help your brothers and sisters. And if they're lost in sin, yeah, have compassion. Others, you just got to go and just boo, 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 and hate that sin and rip them out of that thing. So we're looking inward at ourselves, building ourselves up. We're looking outward at those who are around us, and we're looking upward. Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Amen. To him who is able to keep you and to present you. Again, I'll leave us with Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing that he has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to bear us on eagle's wings and take us all the way home, you guys. It's about putting your trust in Jesus. Surrender your life to him. Surrender your life to him and just walk with him all the way home. Ah, God is good. God, amen. Amen. And all the time, God is good. Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you for the hope that we find in your word, the truth that rests upon such a mountain of evidence, which we thank you for as well, so that we can look to your word and have such, such a, a sigh of relief and peace, knowing that you have blazed the trail in front of us. 
that we can be forgiven not based on the standards that we've grown up with, being good and rewarded and bad and suffer the consequences, but we can be forgiven as a result of receiving your grace and favor and your forgiveness, oh God. Lord, I pray if there are any here who are still just straddling the fence or haven't come in and just laid their life at your feet, I just pray that they would, that they would come to you and, and just release all that into you and be able to walk uprightly before you, just trusting you with every element of their life, that they might have the abundant life, Jesus, that you spoke of, and they might have the peace that passes all human comprehension, and just that assurance and even that longing to move from this location into your presence. Continue to draw them, Father. Thank you for your long-suffering. Father, as we come to the table right now, I just pray that our focus would be towards what avails us of this. Jesus, your sacrifice upon the cross so that our sin can be washed away. Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be genuine before you. Take our lives, Lord, we pray. Take us, O oh God. You purchased us. You redeemed us. Take us and Make us the people you want us to be, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why don't you stand for just a moment while the ushers are coming forth? We're going to receive communion today. Just stretch your legs and then we'll be seated. And I'd ask you to receive the communion elements. And just from our hearts, let's just lift up our hearts to the Lord as we sing these songs of what God has done for us. Can I have the ushers come forward now? And, um, and then we'll receive them together. And just remember again. This is why we can be here. This is why we can have hope. It's because of Jesus. And if you haven't committed your life to Jesus, now's the time. If that's what you want, just, dear Jesus, please forgive me. Be the Lord of my life and the Savior of my soul. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You can be seated. Let's lift up our hearts to the Lord.